Dar Williams, welcome to Tough Cookies. How you doing? Good, thank you. Where are you right now? In New York? Yeah, I just live a, a little bit north of New York City. Um, in the yeah, in the Hudson Highlands, it's called. I love the Hudson, the Hudson Valley, right? Yeah, yeah. We're sort of in the in the sort of the mountainy bluffs part, just just about an hour north. I love that area. Um, and am I right that you grew up in that area? Yeah, yeah. I uh, about thirty miles from here, in in uh, about a county down. But yeah, pr pretty close. Well, listen. I want to congratulate you on this new record. Uh, I'll meet you here. Um, this is your first record in a few years, and I understand that you were making this record right up until the quarantine hit. Can you tell me, like, where were you at with this record when the pandemic? began? Were you finished? Were you almost finished? Where were you? We had a lot of the first mixes and we were about to mix one last song that I had recorded in another studio with someone named Larry Campbell, who's a fantastic guitar player. Oh, great. So yeah. And, and he was, and he was coming down and it's one of those things where we just couldn't get our schedules aligned. And then there was this one day where I said, you know, I, I can, but I can't this whole pandemic thing is starting to happen. Like, and Larry said, you know, I can't make it today either. I don't feel well. Right. And it turned out he had a horrible case of it. So that's where we had a little intersection with the pandemic. Um, and then, um, and then we just did a bunch of mixes where, you know, I would come in and do an overdub and I would wear my mask and they'd set everything up and they'd run out of the room and I'd take off my mask and like, yeah. <laughs> so we did some of that too. I mean, here's the thing, your record, and I've spoken to so many musicians on this show over the last year, and there's this phenomenon that so many people that have released albums have told me, which is that they wrote songs before the pandemic that somehow just feel like they were deepened, you know, in their meaning by the pandemic. And there are a bunch of songs on this record uh, that feel that way to me. Uh, as the songwriter, what's it like to have a moment where you sort of, the, the meaning of a song shifts based on what's going on in the world? Uh, well, it's interesting because um, it's interesting to hear that other people had songs that kind of felt like they presaged the epidemic or, you know, like deepened in their meaning um, because that happened. I mean, this this whole record's called I'll Meet You Here and it's all this like, don't, you know, don't get too hung up on your past and don't get too hung up on the future <laughs> and um, kind of take it as it comes. And so, um, you know, that <laughs> that extra layer where the whole world had to do this was um, was cool for me with and and for all of the songs that had to do with that that theme. And that was a theme, this kind of like meet it when it comes to you. Don't yeah. don't just say like this happened because I'm a bad person and, you know, a bad thing happened because I'm a bad person and all that. Like, don't do any of that. That happened to like the world, and um, and I think that that was, uh, and I, I feel like you know what happened is like, for once and for all, all of those magazine articles that you read about like, you know, live in the present, don't take things personally, just kind of meet it as it comes, you know, and then onto the next article and onto the next picture of like you know, anorectic models wearing a lot of makeup. <laughs> And all the insecurity that's supposed to breed like instead of it being sort of this nice little snippety yeah that's a good idea i'll go live in the present like we just had to yeah you know and it was a lot more <laughs> yeah it had a lot more i don't know, fiber to it my therapist called it mandatory mindfulness uh, <laughs> like we're all everybody was absolutely forced to sit still and you know reflect um uh, and, you know, your record, this, you've been in this business for like 30 plus years and, you know, um, confessional reflective writing goes in and out of fashion. You know, sometimes we're in a pop age, sometimes it's more of a superficial age and sometimes um, it's not. Sometimes people are, you know, in the culture are willing to reflect. And that's why I think your record kind of hits at the right time because people are, everybody I know is going through some shit mm -hmm. and making difficult changes and going through, you know, all kinds of, you know, reflection points in their life. 
That's one of the songs I love is Magical Thinking mm. on the record. It made me think, of course, of Joan Didion, The Year of Magical Thinking. Right. Um, tell me about that song and, and where it came from and, and that phrase, Magical Thinking. Well, I there's Joan Didion's book, but there's also that, you know, that preceded her book. Um, and it's that it's that idea that you, um, <laughs> you know, you just say, um, if if, uh, um, you know, if I do this thing in the next, t you know, if if the light turns in 10 seconds um, or, you know, if I fill my gas tank before. Oh, oh OK, Whoa. sorry, we have to. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Sorry. All right. Um, it, you know, if, if this happens now, I will, um, uh, I'm trying to think of some ritual, you know, if I chop this pepper in the next 15 seconds, then, um, I'm going to be okay today, <laughs> you know, or this person's going to love me back who I wish would loved me, you know? Yeah. So, um, that, uh, that sort of thing came and I, I laughed at it, you know, it just kind of came in my, that, um, this melody piece that came into my mind was like, da, 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 And I was like, magical thinking that, and I thought, whoa, magical thinking. And then I thought, you know, it is time for me to have a little bit of a sense of humor about, you know, like letting it go a little bit, sure. not being so superstitious, sure. you know, letting the future happen. Sure. Uh, saying, I'll meet you here. Like, uh, wherever I am, that's where I'm going to be. Um, yeah. Tell me about this. I, I absolutely love this. I guess you would call it stop, stop motion animation, the video for today and every day, which that is stop motion, like right. whatever it is. I love it. Tell me about the song, but especially tell me about that video because it's just beautiful. Well, my friend Ancha uh, is is a fellow folk singer, and she said, you know, I've been doing this now and, um, you know, I've been doing these videos for other people and I've known you for a long time. And just so you know, I, I would be happy to do one for one of your songs if you had an idea. And I said, there's this new song that's kind of childlike and it's, you know, strangely, it's kind of got a throwback, you know, early Earth Days kind of optimism yeah. to it, which is what that stop motion stuff reminds us of, you know, that that weird Saturday morning stuff. So um, she, uh, those cartoons. So she said, great, send it to me. And as soon as I did, she got in on it. And we had very few conversations, you know, they were great just to make sure we we're on the same page, but mostly she just followed her instincts and that's where we were. It's unbelievable. It looks like it, that would have taken somebody like two years to make. Um, the song, yeah. I mean, um, you know, climate change is on all of our minds and it's yeah. like, it, it, it's anybody at this stage of the game who has turned away from this issue, you know, it's, it's yeah. grabbing us every day and reminding us uh, that this is happening yeah. all around us. <laughs> it's, it's really, and, and actually it's interesting because the song was released as a single like right after Ida. Yeah. So it was sort of like, here's a drought, here's a heat dome, here's some floods, here's fires. And then let's just punctuate the whole thing with a few hurricanes and then like three days later, the song comes out as a single. And, and I think um, it's really hard for a person to feel optimistic when you've just been socked at every point of the globe. And, you know, there were even days, you know, here in New York where we, we got some weird sunsets, you know, because we were, we had this smoke from the yeah. West coast. So nobody was spared. It was very related. And um, that, that said, I've known about this since 1988. You know, they said, hey, there's this thing, it's called global warming. And yeah. and we're like, no way, that just sounds awful. And they said, yeah, and we're going to have temperature spikes and floods and droughts. And, and so, you know, when you know that when you're 20 and you're watching people buy gigantic cars and thinking, you can't do that. Like, we can't do that anymore. <laughs> but you're watching it happen for decades. You know, you, you yeah. tend to just get very sacramental as they say in, in in catholicism that not my religion but um you know you kind of do things like well i'll do this as if doing that is going to make all the difference you know you it, you sort of do it as your offering um and then you realize that you know if everybody did that um something would happen and it's so much better than it was 20 years ago in terms of people having a consciousness about all this stuff like so much better 
I was there and nobody understood. And now people have it there. The one thing that's really important that I'm hearing from my friends in the client climate science world yeah. it's like once upon a time they said this doesn't exist you know there was all that fake science and they said doesn't and now they're saying okay it exists but it's too late so you know don't try and it's such a it's such a scam so actually all that little stuff actually does add up i've seen it and and now you know it's very sweet procter and gamble has this like sustainable packaging thing that they're trying to make for for <laughs> laundry detergent and stuff i'm like oh procter and gamble you okay okay welcome to the party i always just keep thinking we we went to the moon like mm. we've we've done all these moonshot things we we've set really big goals mm -hmm. for ourselves mm -hmm. as a country as a society as a globe you know um you know we we are in the middle of a global pandemic and as challenging and, and tragic as it has been, you know, within a year we had a vaccine because we, you know, scientists put their minds to it. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. It's your video and your song reminds me uh, because it, it can feel very weighty, like it's such a massive problem, climate change. What can we really do? But it, it, it's a reminder that every single day, little things, uh, add up to big things if we all do something. Yeah, yeah. And hope is everything too, because if you, you know, I kind of feel like they're saying, let's just stamp out these few sparks of hope <laughs> and then just and be done with it. And without hope, I mean, it really is screwed without the hope. And, and so, um, but it does, actually it does add up. And actually, I mean, something I've learned, I wrote this book about, you know, communities that I, yes. and, um, and, and there's this, I would talk to somebody at the um, National Renewable Energy Lab uh, in Colorado a while ago for something else I was doing. And, and he said, in 2010, he said, you know, by 2020, we could, the whole world could be 98% renewable energy based on the science we have now. And so what I learned from writing this book is that there's political will, you know, people are like, well, you need the political capital to do this, the political will. But actually, thanks to um, like the Trump world and the Ailes world that preceded it at, at Fox News, which is, you know, Roger Ailes lived in our town. He's, it's not about politics. It's about, it's about ripping things apart. Mm. Um, without the social will, you don't have the political will. And the social will requires us to kind of go, yeah, things are more important than, um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's weird. It's weirdly personal. Like it's, it's weirdly personal to say, I want to wake up in the morning and make the world a better place. And I want to wake up in the morning and, and, you know, um, put some of my money and energy towards, um, this vision that I have of, of a better world. Like it's, it's hard to organize around that. And it's hard. We've been sort of taught that that's sort of embarrassing and weird and like an outlier thing. And I think now what's interesting is we're getting back to it, not being an embarrassment and being and building evidence for how things can work without you know being too sentimental mm. we can there's plenty of stuff that that we can do all the time and we and we all look at each other like oh yeah that was possible despite that narrative of how divided we are dar you just referred to yourself as a folk singer which i i love and one of the things i wanted to ask you was about this term folk singer first of mm. all in 2021, we don't hear the phrase folk singer a lot, um, uh, but you know, you just you as an artist have been often referred to as a singer song, your music singer songwriter, mm -hmm. folk. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen, you know, Americana use right. or maybe even alt, alt country at certain points. Um, what do you is folk singer the phrase that you like the best? Uh, I like them all. I like them all. I, uh, I singer songwriters might. Well, the, here's the thing, like back in the 90s, you know, when we actually sold CDs and it was all very much like this, this department of the record store and this department of the record store, where are we going to put your what slot are we going to put you in? Yeah. And uh, it, there was um, that was going on. So people were like, where do I belong? Like what genre? And also 
it, it was really important. Like folk music was basically something that a friend of mine is called audience based. So you're the volunteers who put together these venues and the, um, and the kind of people who booked it and basically took a pay cut to book this kind of music as opposed to like arena rock yeah. and the managers who did this and the, and the singer songwriters who did this, you know, it, it was sort of like this team effort to kind of be off the beaten track of commercial music so that we could really make sure that the people were in charge of the music as opposed to the industry dictating everything, even though at the end of the day, the industry really follows what they see. Um, yeah. But uh, they, so, so to say, I'm not a folk singer, or I am a folk singer, had a lot to do with how you aligned yourself with this community of people who really worked hard out of the glare of commercial music and commercial resources to have these really enlightening, um, intimate uh, communication experiences called music concerts. Yeah. And so, so that was why it was, imp there was a political importance to calling yourself a folk singer because you wanted to align yourself with those people. And also they wanted to align themselves with all sorts of phenomena outside of the commercial, you know, the commercials say you have to have really bright white, you know, uh, clothing, <laughs> the, the, those people, you know, do the concert to organize these concerts are the ones who like, I'm not believing that hype. We don't need bright white clothing. We don't need those phosphates. We don't need that bleach. We don't need, you know, they're real movers, shakers in their own rootsy way. And so to identify yourself with that music genre was also identifying with a sort of a whole network of communication that I did respect. And it could be a little humorless and it could be a little, you know, uh, <laughs> doctrinaire, but but I I love those those people. And I think if you were willing to be part of the network, you could show up and, play as you know a xylophone with drum loops and and call yourself folk music because it was really how you were allying yourself with with that uh, communication movement it's a statement of purpose uh i would say yeah and it sounds like and, and we have to remind younger generations what the scene was like when you first started because the coffee shop circuit the open mic night circuit um, those tiny, intimate uh, venues, that circuit is not what it was. Um, we don't, the culture has changed dramatically. And what I love about your career, um, all the paths that you've taken, you're still, you know, sitting there with an acoustic guitar and it's in a very intimate, direct, uh, unadorned setting. Um, mm -hmm. singing your songs. Uh, talk to me about what those clubs were like when you first started and maybe name a few of them where you first started. A lot of them are still there. Um, so Passim, actually Passim is, is, is kind of like ground zero for this stuff. And that's in Cambridge. And there's this guy, Matt Smith, who was just taking over um, when I started out. And he's actually expanded it to have much more, you know, a lot of these clubs, so you have Passim and, um, oh gosh, the, you know, uh, the Tin Angel in, in Pennsylvania, in uh, Philly. That's where, and... I, that's where I live, by the way, I'm in Philly. Oh, very good, okay, and so I we, love right. the Tin Angel. Right, Just, so that's. It's gone now. Right, right, a lot of things, so, but you know, new things can come up. Um, Godfrey Daniels up in Bethlehem was there. You had Freight and Salvage, which actually has now moved to a, a larger venue. You have Old Town School of Folk Music in, in Chicago, which is moved to a new venue and expanded. So some of these things are, you know, there's a, the Art Center down in Carborough, North Carolina, uh, the Birchmere in, in Washington, D.C. Right. Um, you know, I mean, some of my career is about like getting up on a stage and saying, look at me, like, look at me who sat, you know, cross-legged on my bed, on my futon, writing this on this guitar, and here I am playing the songs, like, you could do that. You know, there's kind of a, like, there are steps to where I am. It's attainable, as opposed to, like, whoa, you know, she just came shooting out of the sky like a super, you know, supernova. Um, so so the, the venues, just as I sort of, <laughs> sort of show a certain you know, like you could do this to the audience. The The venues kind of had a spirit of like, you're welcome here, Dar. Yeah, you're new. You just came out of like the tip jar gig scene. But um, let's give you a try and you'll get better. And, and we'll, 
<laughs> you know, we'll feed you until then. And, um, and they were sort of filled with very um, patient uh, um, promoters. Like, you know, Alan Pepper brought me to the bottom line in New York City, and he said, I remember, you know, Mary Chapin Carpenter being so shy, and I said, someday people are going to be walking, you know, standing in lines three three people deep around the block to see you and he said and that happened and he said and dar you know you keep keep your mind open to what could happen so yeah like it's like we were hippies you know and hippies are people who just keep their minds open um and so they were incredibly kind and patient as i was starting out and um yeah it made a huge difference i feel like those clubs um and that circuit in some ways sets you up for to be a lifer uh, as mm -hmm. a performer. Um, I, I really appreciate when I was doing the dive bar circuit for so many years and the tip jar and bombing night after night, I have such an appreciation for that now because I learned my craft. Mm -hmm. You learn how to entertain, you learn how to do it eyeball to eyeball. Sometimes there's no stage, you know, you're two feet in front of the crowd yeah. And you learn how to communicate and make people feel the resonance of your songs. And right. later when the stages get bigger, hopefully, uh, you take that with you. Um, you. Yeah. You think I have that right? You, you do. That? You do. And you're right. So just like a sort of and you're, you did a great job with the physical part of it. You know, for me, it was sort of what was the emotional setting. But the physical part. Yeah, it's like <laughs> a lot of things can be called a stage <laughs> and it can be awfully close to the front row and, you know, spitting distance, you know, literal spitting distance. And um, and all of that kind of boot campy stuff was I mean, I shouldn't call it that. That's dishonors boot camps. But um, you know, you had people like breastfeeding and you had kids dancing and you had like a, a person who followed you backstage who wasn't supposed to be there. And so there was some of that too, like getting used to all of the frequencies of audience audiences. And, um, and then there's the whole intimacy of like a person glaring at you the whole time. And then they come up to you afterwards and say, you know, this was incredible. I just, and you're like, your facial expression was, you look like worst. you hated it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, and yet you find out that you never know, you know, all that stuff was really, um, oh, really valuable. And also now I can have a really crappy gig and be like, well, at least it wasn't like, you know, when I tried on those press on nails to try to <laughs> pick better and they got stuck on the strings, <laughs> like three of the songs and I had to like rip them off on the stage. Like, at least it's not that one. Uh, oh. Uh, you know, and all of that, or the, you know, getting lost before GPS and, you know, just making it onto the stage because of a detour. We got to tell these kids today, we had to do it with an atlas. <laughs> I know. We did it without a GPS. We did it out with the cell phones. We, <laughs> there was just all of this. And somehow, I mean, it makes you believe in guardian angels, but it was, it was the kind of thing where you said, okay, if I did this, I mean, I had some seriously humiliating gigs and that was valuable you know it, it was valuable it's valuable for all of us to have those experiences and you wrote uh you've written uh a few books but your travels um with your music over 30 plus years have been has informed two books that i wanted to ask you about the first is the tofu toll booth <laughs> Um, yeah, people yeah. like people who don't do what we do, they don't understand that the food situation, it's, it's like, um, it's rough out there. It's <laughs> rough out there. Yeah. Um, and you were doing it 30 years ago. What prompted you to write this book? That one, I, you know what I, I, um, some friends of mine were talking about driving around forever in, um, uh, Arkansas trying to find like just a good cup of coffee or something. And, and I said, wouldn't it be great if there was some kind of directory just of natural food stores? Cause that's where the good coffee is. And usually that's, you know, where the good neighborhoods are for like, um, a chiropractor or something like that, <laughs> or a cafe that you can sit in or a tattoo parlor if you want that. And so, um, so I thought, you know, if I do this directory of natural food stores, I'm really directing people to those neighborhoods where they can travel and yeah. kind of do their, their thing and uh, like nice thrift stores and stuff. So, um, and I thought this will be my job. Like I'll sing songs on the side and I'll make a little money from that. But what I'm really gonna do is like 
put this book out there and I did this gig in, in <laughs> Vermont when it first came out and my first CD and like I sold 10 CDs and two books. And I was like, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Um, so I'm glad that everything worked out the way it did. And I'm glad that I did the Tofu Toe Booth because it, it did help um, strengthen, you know, that network of, of co-ops and stores. Uh-huh. And um, and some of them, a lot of them are still around and have expanded. And, you know, not because of me per se, but because of certain people, you know, keeping the keeping that beach ball, you know, buoyant up in the air. Um, But I really want to ask you about your, this other book and apologies that I had to write down the title because. Oh yeah. It's, I don't even know. It's a long ass title. What I found in a thousand towns, a traveling musician's guide to rebuilding America's communities, one coffee shop, dog run and open mic night at a time. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, now you wrote this book after the better part of 30 years of traveling Mm -hmm. and um, I'm fascinated by this people we get a very unique perspective uh, as touring musicians on culture Mm -hmm. on culture Uh, what drove you to write this book what had you seen out there that made you think that you you know you had a unique perspective to offer on this subject well, you know, I I played in a lot of places, especially, you know, coming up, but I think even kind of like right in the middle of things where I think that I, you know, my, my, what I, I kind of look like a very friendly child who just woke up from a nap. <laughs> like I just have that kind of, Your oh, word's not you, mine, your word. <laughs> it's sort of like, I look like the kind of person if, if you don't have heat in your dressing room in Maine, then, um, you know, she can roll with it as opposed to someone who looks much more formidable, you know, and, and I would. So I was invited to a lot of places that were just opening their doors or really in their first seasons. And, um, and they were very proud of what they were doing. Um, And I did a lot of house concerts when I was first starting out in places that, you know, I was in the house concert and then I did a church basement and then I was upstairs at the church. And then five years later, this community that thought of itself as kind of, you know, slow and, and, you know, the concert scene was the the subculture, never the culture. All, lo and behold, there was an art center because mm-hmm. that thing that I'm saying, this the social will, what I call positive proximity, had had really kicked up to the point where people would find their dovetailing skill sets, find ways of collaborating, and find ways of of doing stuff. And I was realizing it, you know, the music was just a springboard. Um, to other things that they would do. Like suddenly I'd be hearing about community gardens and trails and clinics, you know, for low income people who could, couldn't afford it and trucks with dentists who would drive around and, and stuff like that. So I, it wasn't just, it was like culture was the springboard to all these other forms of communication and networks um, that were what we would call egalitarian, egalitarian and, um, and thriving and resilient and, and, um, much more resistant to messages of, of division and stuff like that. So I kept on seeing people doing it really well. And it seemed like there were categories of how they did it, like culture, when they would clue into their food, their local food thing, when they would build along any kind of riverfront, any kind of river walk yeah. harmonizes, I, you know, and there's reasons for that. Um, history is a great thing. Like the best example I have is in Phoenixville, just north of you, where they the blob was filmed and um they have a blob fest for a weekend every summer and it's awesome but blob fest was the um beginning of a lot of different kinds of conversations that helped build the downtown back again after a really bad period after the the steel mills closed so i kept on seeing how sort of one thing led to another and how um collaboration you know striving for collaboration was much more important than striving for unity Mm -hmm. unity is fascist you know but Mm -hmm. collaboration is like you can do this i can do this and i kept on seeing like this kind of these similar building blocks and i thought this is a thing and i talked to my mom and i said mom is this a thing and she goes yeah honey it's a thing so i decided to really um uh describe what those building blocks were and um, and I stand by it. I, I think the, the, the places that had those building blocks and had positive proximity did better in the pandemic than other places. 
amazing. I mean, I, I, there's so much good and bad coming from this pandemic. I do hope that, you know, we will all take an opportunity to reevaluate how we do things personally yeah. and, and as a, in our society. Mm -hmm. um, and also the value of art uh, yeah. in our society and music. Um, I want to ask you, though, before you go, Dar, the first song that I ever heard of yours that turned me on to you is when I was a boy. And you've been singing this song for many years now. Um, it's an amazing song. And, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot has changed, not just in your life, but in our world since you wrote this song. And um, the way that we talk about gender and gender roles, our perception of gender and sexuality you know, in our culture has changed uh, significantly. Uh, we're not where we should be, but we're, we're somewhere in these 30 years since you wrote the song. What's it like for you to sing that song now uh, compared to then? It's completely completely quaint compare it was it was really um something happened i wrote here i was you know in in the northeast and in, in northampton which is like the lesbian mecca of the northeast and there was the feminist movement there was the you know lgbt movement and you know really the beginnings of the the, the trans movement um and you know there i was writing this song and i thought it's not this isn't like a feminist song. Like, you know, I, I had enough kind of training, you know, from college or coming out of a deep depression or something to be like, what's the truth? What's the truth? And I just thought, wow, I'm really going to piss people off. But the truth is that when I was a boy is, is really my pathway to understanding what it, how painful it must have been for men to be men now and to say when I was a girl, I had certain kinds of freedom, you know, I had, so it was really a gender song, um, more than a feminist song. You know, I thought my truth is that I'm, I'm really kind of feeling out the, the, the potholes in gender that were experienced, not the, um, not the feminist part of it per se. And it turned out that that was the beginning of, um, what a lot of people were looking at, like really what it is to, have a gender and to identify one way or another and then of course like to have that fluidity you know between them so like we're kind of in the flow right now so even to call it out with all of those names in my song is almost quaint now because now there's just so much flow and um you know my kids it's there's just a lot of like i can boys can cry and and girls can you know I don't know, <laughs> punch you out, you know, <laughs> you know, girls can wield a sledge sledgehammer or if, or if you want to, you know, paint your toenails and you're, you're a girl, that doesn't mean that you're, you know, all one gender, mm -hmm. all, all one thing. And so it seems like we've kind of hit a nice continuum. Um, and, uh, so it's fun almost like as an archival thing to sing, <laughs> sing that song now, like we really have come so much farther on it. And I think wars will not be fought because people will feel less anxious about guarding their identity and, and fortressing themselves up behind these names yeah. and identities because there's so much more acceptance of, of you know, the, the fluidity within one person. Lives will be saved. Lives have been yeah. saved. And um, not to overstate it, but music, you know, is right at the forefront of these conversations. I really feel like that song holds up uh, oh. <laughs> i don't want you to, I, I don't want you to think that it's quaint it, it, it's it's um you know it's touching it it it, it 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 touches on these inflection points around gender at, at, you know at different ages it's true true and we all have to make those decisions you're right i mean there's still that we still have plenty of rites of passage and our country has plenty of rites of passage ahead culturally as well so um so you're right. No, and it it still has its it still has its place, but it's really interesting to see how far, you know, to see kids, you know, same sex couples going to the prom without a blink, you know, and um and same sex couples, of course, getting married, and that's just, 
you know, a woman says, oh, gosh, I forgot, you know, my keys, I have to call my wife, and you don't go, oh, wow, you know, <laughs> like, there's no oh, wow anymore. We're in there, you know, and Canada's even farther down oh, the absolutely. road. So, so that's, so here we are. It, I never dreamed we would get this far. And um, so I'm, so that's why I consider what I did to be a, a bit of history. I think so. I want to ask you before you go, uh, uh, the the end of the record, you do another one of my favorite songs of yours, You're Aging Well, which you've released, you know, you released really early in your career. And um, there's the beautiful duet version with you and Joan Baez. Um, why update it now? Why again? You know, there was, well, first of all, I'm the same age she was when she took me on the road. Wow. Which was, it does, I mean, at the time, she was like, it's like she walked, you know, <laughs> she walked on air to me. I really, I mean, I still feel that way about her. And how old were you at that time? 27, 28. And, and, and that was a, that was an opportunity that besides giving you I would say a career boost. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Was it something that gave you, I don't know, confidence or sense of validation for your music? Yeah, well, you know, she, that's Joan. I mean, there's no, there, Joan was a witness. Joan was a friend. Joan was, um, she, <laughs> there's so much I can't say, like that she, you know, just sort of, well, she like told me, let's say about you know, like what shoes to wear, you know, and there's, she, she was really into like stretch velvet. You know, she's like, this is perfect. It looks good under the light. It doesn't, you need, don't need to iron it. You can roll it up. It's easy to buy. It's, you know, and um, I remember talking to these journalists and saying like, they would say like, oh, what is it like to be with Joan Baez? I was like, she's so helpful. Like she told me about stretch velvet and you just hear like this suspended pen. Like, no, I'm not going to write that down. I'm like, and I also heard about how Czechoslovakia had a nonviolent revolution and they consider her to be one of like the five reasons it was nonviolent. And you hear like, scratch, 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 scratch. <laughs> but I, the sisterly stuff that she did and the witnessing along the way to say, you know, she would just say, oh, I love it when you do that song. And I'd find her in the wings of the, the stage after I'd played a song. That stuff added up, that sisterly stuff did a lot. And I realize now how, how important that is to do, you know, for other musicians. Yeah. Um, as, as much as I believe in nonviolent revolution and, and love that she did that, I love also that she kind of went out of her way to be like, you don't have to pay attention when people do that. Like somebody hissed me in the audience. She goes, oh yeah, been there. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sure she's heard it all. Well, she's, you know, she said at one point that she said, I'm, I'm used to being, I really know a lot about being loved. I do. And she said, I really know a lot about being hated. And she goes, and then the rest of my life is kind of figuring out how to be in between. Cause wow. you know, she's, she's, you know, navigating friendships when you're a famous person like that. I, you know, I watched her doing that. She did a beautiful job, but it, it, it's, uh, it's hard not to, <laughs> not it's it's hard to breathe regularly around a person that you've loved that much in that way um so uh yeah she 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 changed everything and she built a foundation helped me build the foundation for everything i do in my career yeah well i just love that you retouched on the song um acknowledging aging yeah, well, that's that's the thing. It's like it's a kind of a both sides now thing. Like you write it in your twenties, and then you sing it twenty five years later, and and you go, wow, you know, this means something a little different. It's like uh, it's like you gave yourself a challenge in your twenties to see if you could, you know, make it in your career to the, to an age uh, of wisdom, <laughs> you know, an experience to live in the song. And, you know, like Joan Baez, you are a lifer. You can hear uh, in this record, I'll meet you here, lived in uh, and the craft that you have worked on for so many years. Um, before you go, what what can we expect uh, from you soon? Are you going on tour? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how will that be? Where, where, can, where can we see you coming up? We're going to, we're going to be everywhere. Actually, we're not in the South, which is interesting because it's a, you know, it's a real hotspot for, for the coronavirus. So, um, we're going to be not, 
doing that right away, but that's just a coincidence. Um, we'll be in the Northeast. We'll be so New England, Midwest, West Coast, West to um, uh, uh, not Australia, Arizona, and then um, and then one last swing sort of down through Charlottesville, like sort of mid mid Atlantic states. So we're gonna hit everything and um, in those regions, and um, some places are a little smaller. Like we didn't want to get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> And I think that turned out to be a good idea. Um, and um, we're, people are going to have to be masked and, and either vaccinated or showing proof that they have a negative test, which, right. you know, is it, we'll do our best. Um, and we have to be masked backstage. We can't, we can't hook up, man, which is such a drag. Oh. Um, and <laughs> we have to, like, not hang out with our friends. And I can't hang out afterwards with the audience. But, but... I have done concerts now out inside, not just outside. Yeah. And it seems pretty darn normal. I did one last week and it was weird yeah. for a minute. And then I said, Oh, we can do this. We can yeah. do this. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it's totally, um, I don't know. There's just so much muscle memory around doing it that we just kind of break through to the parts that are familiar and can kind of cope with. It's like, you know, wearing a mask in a supermarket, like didn't think you could do that, but here we are. So it's been great. I mean, people are coming out and um you know unless you're going to treat it like a big conspiracy um and then like the people who don't get vaxxed also don't want to wear a mask so that's kind of you gotta we've got to leave that at the door otherwise i haven't had any problems at any of the um indoor stuff that i've done there have been after after reports of problems so i th think we're well we're doing it <laughs> well best of luck thank you Stay healthy. I wish you a lot of success, good health, happiness. Um, I'll meet you here is fantastic. I hope we get another chapter of the Tofu Toll book. I <laughs> get another installment of what I found in a thousand towns. Just keep it up, Dar Williams, and we'll talk to you real soon. Thank you so much for being on Tough Cookies. That's so great. Thank you so much.